And you're trying to give the young people something that will help them. Yet you don't know exactly what it ought to be. Welcome back to the Teach Thought Podcast. My name is Drew Perkins, Director of Professional Development here at Teach Thought. And just a reminder that we have registration ongoing for our Leadership PBL event, October 18th here in downtown Louisville, Kentucky, where leaders can come and learn more about project-based learning, develop a plan for implementation that is sustainable. So registration and more information is available if you go to wegrowteachers.com forward slash events, and that will be where our future events will be Hosted and details of those events will be as well. So, I encourage you to go over there as well as check out all of our professional development services. And of course, we always love for you to leave reviews and share our work, our podcasts, our blogs, our website, anything that you feel is interesting and important and might help other educators better prepare learners for the modern world. In this podcast episode, I spoke with James Lindsay, who is a repeat guest. He was on in January of 2019, and this conversation focused around a new book that he is publishing with co-author Peter Bogosian called How to Have Impossible Conversations. And as I say in the podcast, I really think that this is an important piece of work for educators, not because it's pedagogy specific, but it's mindset specific and really touches on some of the pieces of curiosity and questions and epistemology that we really need to focus on in our teaching and learning as we think about moving away from a push model of teaching towards one that is a pull model of teaching. We talked at some points, at several points, around critical race theory and social justice, which are obviously controversial topics and hard to have conversations around. And that is a passion of mine in how we advance those topics and issues in a way that's productive and not destructive. So we touched on those things as well as those pieces of the role of questions and reframing and balancing and boy just lots of i thought really interesting pieces so again i really recommend that you check this book out in the links we'll put the show notes and i hope you enjoy the podcast james welcome back to the podcast it was january of this year that we last spoke about social justice and i'm excited to talk with you this time as you have an upcoming book with uh, Peter Bogosian that's coming out here, should be right around the time of this podcast publishing, called uh, How to Have Impossible Conversations. So tell us a little bit about what you've been doing since January. I'm uh, expecting that a lot of it has been on this book, and I know that you spend a lot of time and energy, unbelievable amounts of time time and energy on social media and Twitter, sort of battling against what I think is probably bad thinking. It's amusing to to watch. It's sometimes exhausting to watch. I'm sure it's exhausting to do. So tell us a little bit more. Um, Yeah, so it is true. Uh, Mea culpa, mea culpa. I uh, definitely spend too much time and have spent too much time on social media, uh, if you will, battling or trying to. I I have a rule, actually, with social media where if I'm not having fun, I go away. And so I'm trying to have fun with it, uh, trying to make some good points, trying to get the messages out there. Most of that is about social justice. I have done, since we last spoke, quite a bit to do with this book, How to Have Impossible Conversations. Uh, which is, like you said, about to come out. September 17th is when it hits stores, so it may have just done that by the time people are listening to this. Um, But actually, most people don't even know this. Uh, While we did that so-called Grievance Studies hoax project, which was impossibly difficult, was actually when we wrote the book. So we wrote a a 77,000-word book on a completely separate topic while we wrote all those academic papers. Um, it It was pretty intense. 
but uh, we have put together a lot of stuff to get the book out and, you know, gone and had impossible conversations across lots of different groups of people and tried to connect with people and, and put the stuff into practice. Uh, also, I have continued my studies into social justice, not that that's necessarily relevant right now, uh, and it'll be relevant in the spring, maybe late spring, getting toward May. Uh, the other person who we did the project with, uh, the paper writing project, Helen Pluckrose in England, she and I wrote a book explaining the roots of social justice theory, where it came from and how it goes into practice and what you can do about it. And so that should be coming out in May. So we've been pretty busy. Yeah, yeah, that uh, sounds exhausting just in that, not to, to mention the other pieces. Well, there's lots to get into here, and for me, just personally, I think the, and I've said this on our podcast before, that it, it's just a personal mission of mine or, or belief of mine that we have to be able to have hard conversations, that it's really, really important, uh, maybe more so, We've all, it's always been true, but maybe it's just become more uh, pronounced because of social media and the way that it's easy to not have productive conversations and just yell at each other. And as it pertains to my daughters, I try to really make sure that they are able to have awkward, hard, difficult conversations. But when we think about teaching and learning in our schools, pre-K through university, I really do think that we have played a role in the current climate in which people are really struggling to have conversations and I, I I wonder how much of the focus on product versus process and lack of focus on questions which is a big piece and a big part of the book how much that that focus on answers versus questions has played a role so whether we're talking about social justice critical race theory which is certainly related uh politics of, of any kind religion uh, anything right so being able to have these hard conversations i think is absolutely tantamount to the structure of our our society and our culture that seems like it's it's crumbling as we watch it i guess uh let's start with the you, the book starts with the seven fundamentals of good conversations and there are seven pieces here goals partnerships rapport listen shoot the messenger intentions and walk away and a few of those like shoot the messenger and there's some things later that talk about not introducing facts into these conversations seem like they're counterintuitive because lots of folks feel like that's the way to sort of win the conversation but that's not what we should be doing. We're, we're not trying to win the conversation. We're trying to understand. So I guess talk a little bit, if you would, about those seven fundamentals. Well, I mean, what you just said is really the kind of key thing. And you are right. There are the, there are a lot of the techniques in the book are quite counterintuitive. Uh, those two that you mentioned, avoiding facts, for example, and um, shooting the, the messenger are, are extremely counterintuitive. But they are necessary to having good conversations. And the, the, the giveaway in your own speech, if you don't mind me pointing it out, was actually that you said, you know, people think that they're going to win the conversation. Well, how do you win a conversation? Right. Conversation is something you have with somebody. And uh, so, you know, there is no winning a conversation. And a lot of people get into this kind of debate mode where they think they're going to win a debate and let that stand in for conversation. And they're... There are benefits to debate. There are reasons to have debate. There are contexts in which debate is the right format. But in most contexts, when you're talking with a friend, when you're talking with somebody, even somebody that you don't really know online, it's much more helpful to have uh, actual conversations with people. So that's where the first fundamental in the book is, is goals, is to set out your goals for the conversation. You know, if you're at Thanksgiving dinner with your crazy Uncle Terry and your crazy Uncle Terry just can't leave it alone, Right. What should be your goal? Should it be to own Uncle Terry at the Thanksgiving table? Should, I mean, what's your goal of the conversation or should it be to try to steer that steer the conversation to something that, you know, you guys have mutual interest in? Maybe it's football. Maybe it's, you know, yeah, maybe if crazy Uncle Terry can't let it go, it's probably not art, but maybe it's art. You never know what it is. Um, but you would as, as the person with that relationship. So one of the goals might be preserve the relationship, further the relationship, deepen the relationship. As the next fundamental talks about, it might be build rapport. Uh, if it's somebody you don't really know, 
uh, building rapport with somebody is is incredibly valuable. Why? Because how? And this is why again, there's counterintuitive ideas like delivering messages and avoiding fact, avoiding delivering messages and avoiding introducing facts in the conversations are so important. Is that if you want to use those tools, if you want to deliver a message and you want to be heard, or if you want to um, state facts and have people process them. The, the mechanism by which that happens in human beings, who, which are not uh, Vulcans, they're not perfectly logical robots, or perfectly logical pirates as the old uh, learning tool goes, um, they're, we're, we're kind of stupid monkeys, and the, the mechanism is trust. If the person doesn't like and trust you, they're not gonna listen to you. And the easiest ways to build trust and rapport are to become interested in the other person, to try to understand where they're coming from on their terms, to ask them a lot of questions, genuine questions, not you know interview questions or some weird you know thing you can read in some pickup artist manual or some baloney, but to genuinely become interested in what they're they're talking about, why they think what they think, and to ask the natural questions that come up. Try to understand where they came from. If you try to deliver a message, for example. Um, Maybe the person's receptive to the message and maybe they're not. If they're receptive to the message, you wouldn't have had to deliver the message in the first place. You could just have had the conversation more naturally and it would have got through. If they're not receptive to the message, they're just it's just going to bounce off of them. So there's no point in delivering a message. It's just going to put up defensive uh, barriers. When you introduce facts into conversations, people tend to believe, even though you might know that they're wrong, and you probably do know that they're wrong in a lot of cases, uh, people tend to believe that the things that they believe are based in fact, even when they're they're wrong about what the facts are. And so correcting their facts or introducing some fact that should change their belief, if there's anything deeper than, you know, oh, well, the moon is made out of cheese, you know, no, it's actually made out of rock. You know, if it's anything deeper, something that people care about, nobody cares what the moon's made out of, not really. But if it's something people care about, like they really care about it, or if they've got some feeling that gets hurt when it comes up, or if they're scared about it, or something like that. Uh, you've heard the phrase alternative facts uh, in a kind of negative political connotation around or around the president right now. Uh, it was big a couple of years ago, people talking about how he had alternative facts. Well, people have alternative facts. They, they may be wrong, or they may be interpreting the facts wrong, but they have an alternative facts. And so when you introduce facts, you actually are doing something that you don't want to do, which is you're encouraging that person to dig into their alternative facts and try to make a case around them. So in other words, you're giving the conversation partner that you're speaking with the opportunity and the impetus to try to uh, reinforce his or her own belief that she are, he or she already holds, um, which is exactly the opposite of what you want to do. On the other hand, if you ask a lot of questions and you're genuinely interested, you'll find that a lot of people will talk themselves kind of out of their own ideas. Uh, so it's a matter of what your goals are. Uh, if you want to help re reinforce somebody's beliefs, introduce a lot of facts and tell them what they're supposed to think and watch them fight you and dig in deep on it. And if you want to uh, you know, maybe be persuasive, I, I would urge you to take the more counterintuitive approach and, and ask a lot more questions than you, you things you say. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting parallel, and in, you know the 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 urge uh, at least on social media, and I think less so in person because it becomes much more awkward when you actually have to do it or try to do it in person. But that idea that you're going to dunk on somebody and own them and own the libs or this or that, you know, there are people on both sides of any issue. And certainly in politics, I think about like Ben Shapiro, for example, who uh, my guess is you're, you're familiar with him, uh, conservative uh, commentator, but and and off, often very rational and reasonable and thoughtful about things. But then every so often, you know, he does this thing with the leftist tears, which I find to be just, uh, I mean, it's sad because it kind of goes against that. It's like, all right, let's own the libs. Let's own, let's own the, the, the right or whatever. So moving away from that, I don't know if it's an instinct, and, and hopefully it's not an instinct. It, it certainly doesn't seem to be productive, even if it's a, a short-term high. But shifting that thinking in how do we how do we build that trust and rapport in a classroom, and and when we think about giving feedback to students and teachers and students giving feedback to one another, 
that trust and rapport is a really big, big piece there. And de- developing that relationship, the thinking of radical candor is is kind of in that that uh, mindset as well. But we want to make sure that we are developing that relationship because, as you said, there's no way to 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 have that productive conversation if you're approaching this as enemies and in that right. in that spirit when we think about social justice and the the like critical race theory or gender studies any of this i i find it so frustrating my my guess is you find it very frustrating as well that people assume that if you are questioning anybody's you know Robin D'Angelo, for example, White Fragility. If we question her, and of course the premise of her book is if you question her, you're you're being racist. So that standpoint, that mindset, we want to make sure like just because we're questioning doesn't mean we're saying that we don't believe in social justice or we don't believe that there's racism. Of course there's racism, but let's think about it productively. Yeah, so it's really interesting, and what you're bringing up is actually a really sad point. Um, It's one of these cases, I don't know if you've ever read Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind, where he talks about morality binds and blinds. And so here's a case where where the blinding aspect, they think they're doing the right thing, and they're so morally up on it that, that they're blind to the damage that they're causing. But so one of the things you started to just hint at is in, in the book very early on we discuss that um, minds only change. So if you're talking about an educational context, that's obviously the point is to change minds toward you know being more educated in whatever subjects. So th- that only happens. Learning only happens. Minds only change. In fact, rapport and trust only happen in, a, in an environment of psychological safety. So we're really keen on that throughout the beginning of the book, and we lean on it throughout the whole book, is that you have to take steps to create psychological safety. So if you're delivering messages at somebody, they may become, they may start to feel psychologically unsafe. Oh, this person's just trying to convince me of something or indoctrinate me, or they have their own agenda, or they don't care about me, or whatever. Uh, so with, with students, obviously, you know, as much as you can, following Socrates, the great teacher of, of antiquity, you know, asking all the questions you can instead of, you know, just stating things is very helpful. Where it comes to stuff like white fragility is, this is the thing is, you know, they think, this is why it's so sad. It's, it's one of those morality blinding them. They think they're doing the right thing and don't even realize the consequences. So if learning only takes place in, in, in environments of psychological safety, right, and if true conversation can only take place in environments of psychological safety with one to another, um, the theories like critical race theory will come out and tell you immediately that that's their objective is to create psychological safety but then they'll tell you for the most oppressed, for the most marginalized, for the people who have historically been left out. And the the truth is there are other ways to create psychological safety than by tipping the scales to where everybody except those people has to feel psychologically unsafe. If you feel like you're unable to disagree or ask questions or debate or uh, just you know challenge what's been put in front of you, because you're going to get called a racist. And in the current milieu, where that's really widely accepted now in a lot of circles, uh, very credibly be called a racist, even though it's not true, uh, that doesn't generate psychological safety. That generates the exact opposite. It's it's incredibly unsafe. It, it is a form of, of almost psychological abuse and tyranny. It's the opposite of creating a nice learning environment for most people, such that you can try to bend the system in a way that claims to give psychological safety to a very small number of people as though, or even if it's a lot of people, it doesn't matter, as though there are no other ways to create psychological safety, like just using, relying on human dignity or respecting one person to another as individuals. Uh, We have other techniques that that have been well established and and have, have wrought tremendous civil rights victories over over the the decades, slow, admittedly, very slowly, um, to the point where the world that we live in now is is unrecognizable to somebody from 1950 or from uh, any earlier period. And I actually have a personal story in my life that proves that that's the case, that it's unrecognizable. Um, So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really a sad thing that we should be trying in educational spaces in particular, but really everywhere people are, are conversing and learning 
trying to to create psychological safety for as many possible participants as you can. And so, you know, you say stuff like Robin DiAngelo, that the thesis of her book, and it's no exaggeration, uh, their book White Fragility, the thesis of the book is that if you disagree with her or you don't go along with it or you shut up and refuse to speak or you go away from it and try to avoid it, if you do any of those things, that you're actually participating in a racist way of thinking and that you're a racist. And so that doesn't create psychological safety for the vast majority of people. It, it's very, very harmful. It's it's being considered a racist is extraordinarily socially damaging. It's incredibly psychologically damaging. Nobody wants to participate. Very few people, I should say, want to participate in this. And those who do don't mind if you call them racist. They're proud of it. Uh, I do live in the Southeast. I know some racists and they are proud of it. Um, they have no problem being called that. Uh, <laughs> so it's, the whole thing is, is an act in giant uh, backfiring. And the fact that it's taking over education is extremely concerning because it becomes impossible to have a genuine learning environment. And if you want, beyond Robin D'Angelo, for example, you have uh, other scholars, for example, Barbara Applebaum in her 2010 book called Being White, Being Good, which is about complicity with racism. Uh, she indicates that the only way, if you're presented with social justice type arguments, and I don't really want to linger on social justice too much, but the only way that you're allowed to question those is so that you seek clarification to ultimately agree with them. And I mean, hopefully people can see that there's something not right about that approach. And that kind of mentality is standard. It is the, uh, it, it is, it is the, the state of the art in, in this so-called critical race theory approach to pedagogy. Um, so it's, it's really concerning because it, it undermines for many, many people. And eventually, to be honest with you, everybody, nobody's safe. You can't be a black person and question critical race theory and come out without being called something like an Oreo or a coconut or an Uncle Tom or something worse. It's you, Nobody's safe right. from, from this. It does not create psychological safety for people to be introduced into an environment that is based on that kind of a paradigm. Uh, and learning requires psychological safety. If there's one theme in the book that everybody should take home, besides the 30 whatever techniques, 36 I think techniques for how to have more productive conversations, it should be that learning and sharing take place in an environment of psychological safety, which has to be as broad an umbrella, as big a tent as possible, and it has to use fair and equitable, you know, fair methods to to achieve it, which requires. Um, ultimately universal liberalism and and recognizing each human being's individuality and resting in human dignity. Right. I have not read Righteous Mind from uh, Jonathan Haidt. I did have him on the podcast recently, and, and I'm a big fan of Coddling of the American Mind. I'm imagining that it's pretty consistent in the thinking. And the, you know, the, the idea that we can't talk about these hard things, which is, of course, why we have to be able to have these impossible conversations. You're right. So the, the when you see somebody who is sufficiently woke being called out by somebody who's more sufficiently woke, it starts to, the, the, the rational people start to recognize that, as you said, there's no, it, it won't work eventually. So it's... Huh. Let it, me give you an idea of that. I mean, we saw publicly recently, right, that Sarah Silverman got canceled. Uh -huh. <laughs> she got attacked. She has been a fairly heavy-duty right. uh, woke crusader or borderline woke crusader or whatever, using her star power to do it. And then she came under fire for something that she did uh, which if you actually look at the theme of it, it's a very progressive thing that she did uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, but even more to the point, I just saw an article like last week in Slate magazine that's saying that white fragility itself has a whiteness problem. <laughs> Robin D'Angelo's thing is too white. So if they're going to come for her and the people who support her, they're going to come for everybody eventually. Even Rama D'Angelo can't have psychological safety around her own ideas in the environment that's being created by this. So it's a disaster for education. It's an absolute disaster. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful tool if you want your so-called educational system to, to possess the one truth that you're going to beat into everybody and use fear and vulnerability and guilt to make sure it sticks or other other tools of emotional manipulation. But I mean, that's 
what you would expect out of, you know, a fundamentalist religious sect, not out of education, especially right. secular liberal education in an advanced democracy. Right. Yeah. So that when it starts to self-destruct, as I said, it becomes apparent to, to anybody who can pay attention close enough that it will self-destruct. So to be to be very, very clear for anybody who is listening and who might mistake, like th- we're, neither of us are saying that that these issues are not worth working on. So one of the things that were that the book talks about is reframing. And I do think that that's a really great tactic or strategy in having these conversations. So using questions, to have that balance, right? So one of the questions I posed on Twitter, which actually I think probably maybe breaks one of the one of the social media rules, but something it was how can we use the best intentions of wokeness to help us make important and necessary cultural progress without destroying important and necessary features of society. So not saying that that the the sentiments and the idea of making progress within our culture and our society uh, that that wokeness that that um, the the spirit of it is not important because it is but how do we do that in a way that doesn't self-destruct and i don't know is there a way that we can introduce social justice topics in our classrooms pre-k through university that does it without being ideologically um, one-sided i mean sure so uh a couple of things that you just said all kind of resonate first it is correct we uh, i mean i will speak for you because you just said it but for myself certainly we are not opposed to or or, or even dismissive of the realities of racism and sexism right. and the problems attendant to that. In fact, what we're doing is w- what we're doing because we we actually care a lot about those problems and we hope that they're done right and they're done, as you're saying, without introducing a method that will, you know, self-destruct or tear apart institutions or, or um, create backlash or any of these things that we blatantly can see happening around us as everywhere they go. Um, and the reframing tool is extremely valuable. So in the book, we talk about this idea of reframing a conversation. So the the easiest way to think about what reframing a conversation would, would be like uh, is it, it's kind of a subtle shift in the subject. But I always think of that meme that went from the, the Matrix movie where you have the Morpheus character holding, you know, sitting there with his, his, sungla- his impossible sunglasses on his nose. And it's, what if I told you that? And then there's some other idea that, you know, opens your mind. Mm. And so the, that's kind of the idea of, of reframing. So here you, with social justice, for example, or critical theory, you could say, what if I told you there's another way to address racism that doesn't require us to adopt critical race theory? And so then there's a conversation to be had there. You can start saying, well, well, how? There's a question, you know, there's natural curiosity. And once you have natural curiosity, you have a desire to hear the answer. And so let there's, there's a few things you can do. One thing you can do is if somebody actually knows what they're talking about, they can start to suggest. Another is that you can start to brainstorm. Uh, brainstorming can be taken in a technique that's more advanced later in the book through what's called dialectical synthesis, uh, which came from the work primarily of the German philosophers uh, Hegel and Fichte. Um, Dialectical synthesis is basically the philosophical collaborative method. It's, you know, let's brainstorm some ideas, maybe. Let's give me the best summary of how could we do social justice without relying upon this critical race theory and and ideological tool. How could we do it, say, from a perspective of liberalism? So you throw out some ideas, and I try to tell you, you know, the weaknesses of your ideas, not like I try to own you or shut you down. It's like, okay, so that's really good. Here are the weaknesses I see in that. So what could we do to improve those? And you say, oh, I see it, you know, okay. And so then you can go through, back and forth we go, and you propose some ideas, I propose some ideas, and we take turns intentionally and willfully being open to the idea that the other person is... You know, the saying is iron sharpens iron. Well, you can do that in a mean way where you're going out into the social media and trying to get better at arguing with people and debating. Or you can do it in a productive way where we're deliberately using each other's iron to sharpen our own and to to make our, our understanding of the situation better. When you do it in that positive, constructive way, it's actually called dialectical synthesis, or as we called it in the book, just synthesis. And it's a very, very useful tool. Uh, how can you bring that into the educational system is exactly the same thing. 
is you can do that with your students. The the Again, the social justice approach isn't all crap. I don't want to give off that impression. The idea that they want to have discussion around these topics is actually pretty useful given how culturally salient they are. But what you actually have to do is you have to be able to be open-ended about it. You have to be able to weigh one perspective against another. And then when, when tempers or feelings flare, you have to be able to reframe around those and make it so that the... Uh, you know, the students feel like they're that they're being understood and heard, but that also that there's not necessarily, you know, the right answer that the that the theorist or the teacher in charge is coaxing everybody toward and trying to make them adhere to. You know, if you're going to have an open ended discussion, then you get a lot of room for 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 growth. If you're in a class that, you know, it wouldn't work in mathematics or necessarily in science classes. But if you were in a class that taught something like literature, there's all kinds of space at that point to start bringing in examples from from literature and in challenging students to think through those issues. And then if you are literally aware, uh, then you can start to, you know, point out, for example, you know, the, the historical context. If you're reading Shakespeare's Othello, you might point out the best history understands is that race wasn't a major issue at the time, but you have this interracial relationship and there's a scandal. Why might there have been a scandal if we can realize that race probably wasn't a big issue? Oh, what religion and that, so, that social context was, and he was a more. And so now you have this, you know, that you have space to start trying to understand what's really going on uh, and to create dialogue with students. But the, the issue only becomes when it, it becomes that there's this, you know, I, when you're like, I'm sorry, Sally, you're speaking from a position of privilege, or um, if it was in a religious context, just to draw a parallel, you know, you know, that's very good, Johnny, but what you're saying uh, is contrary to scripture, or is in fact, uh, you know, <laughs> this sounds like the words of Satan in your mouth. Uh, when you start getting into that kind of thing, then then you're no longer educating, you're, you're indoctrinating, you're, you're doing something different. And so it's it's a matter of kind of recovering the old uh, the old educational theory before it started going into these critical pedagogy methods. You know, pedagogy of the oppressed. Pablo Ferreri would be a big one that was influential. Bell Hooks is teaching to transgress. I've got a book called "Is Everybody Really Equal?" that I just got recently by uh, Senzoy and Robin D'Angelo. I forgot Senzoy's first name. That's bad, but uh, so it is. And um, these kinds of things have really been pushed in this critical method. How do you draw out more about racism? How do you draw out more about this? How do you, this is the correct view of how you have to view all this. That can actually be sidestepped and you can go back to how do we negotiate difference um, in a way that respects every individual and their dignity and how do we hear each other and reach out. I mean, when my kids were going through high school, the, the gay straight alliance was a really big thing at the time and my kids were involved in that and it created at the I mean I saw what was going on and it wasn't terribly concerning to me at the time there was a lot I don't know what it's doing now but there was a lot of just opening space for dialogue and letting people hear each other out and there was no pressure to to that I saw at least from what little bit of it I saw and heard from them to be that oh well here's how you have to be an ally and this is the only right way and you know, blah, 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 this is the oppression and, and all this. It was just actually about getting kids together and helping people realize that kids are kids despite difference and, and we can be friends and th there are other ways. Right. Well, it, it gets to the the epistemology piece that is part of the book. And, and when we think about the shift and, and I think about how we push uh, traditional teaching is pushing stuff learning knowledge whatever ideas at kids and expecting them to listen take it in learn it regurgitate it moving on to a pull dynamic which is that question so how do we use inquiry and questions to pull that thinking and pull the the thinking not necessarily like knowledge is a byproduct of a great education it's not necessarily the aim and so that shift would i think really make a huge difference here but i do want to to linger on because one of the things you said to talk about privilege and that's that's a word that is really really making the rounds right now there's no doubt 
in my mind, that I have privilege. We all have a privilege in some way, some way, shape, or form. Anybody who lives in the United States, there's a sense of, there's a, certainly, we have a privilege for, for living here uh, versus living in other places, and kind of how you define that is is part of that, that equation. But if you would kind of unpack, like, why is using privilege and in what ways is using privilege in those academic conversations problematic? So the main way that I see it is um, under, for example, a a, a critical race pedagogist, um, an educator uh, named Allison Bailey has a concept called privilege preserving epistemic pushback. It's a very fancy word as George Carlin would joke about. It has a hyphen, it has like 1100 syllables in it. Um, so it means you can't really know what it means and it means something else that could be expressed much more simply. Uh, but the idea there is that, um, the way that it gets applied, and this is Alison Bailey's not some fringe figure in, in educational theory. She's very significant, uh, has many, many very influential papers. She's right in the thick of, of things as far as the, the forefront of this field goes. And so it's very informative. So the idea with privilege preserving epistemic pushback is that let's say that you're pinned to somebody who has privilege. And of course, privilege is going to be defined in very naive ways. It's going to be defined in terms of your skin color, for example, taking very little or nothing into effect or into account from, say, your uh, how much money you grew up with, you know, what economic class you were in, or something like that. Uh, so, you people with privilege, when they're confronted with ideas that challenge their privilege will push back epistemically. They'll fight against that, having their privilege have aspersions or doubt or guilt attached to it. Um, And so what you see then is you see this tool that's put forth in the social justice educational context. When you have, let's say, that um, some piece of, of racial theory is put out and it's maybe a bit dubious or something and a white student decides that they don't agree with what's said or they have a question or they think it's unfair or something like that and then they challenge that a good example um would often be especially with younger people you'll see the the issue of using the n-word why can't why why can black people use it but white people can't would be one issue that's going to come up a lot or um you'll have people would say the issue of it appearing in Huckleberry Finn, you know, should you read it in the context of Huckleberry Finn or should it not be spoken? You know, let's say you're doing partial in-class readings of Huckleberry Finn, you've got an issue there or should Huckleberry Finn even be assigned anymore? Or, um, another one would be that if you were say what's called the use mention gap, so if you were to uh, use the N word against somebody as an epithet, that's one thing. But if you were to say, you know, Johnny called Billy an N word, that's the men- you're mentioning it. You're not actually calling anybody that. Right. Right. So all of those issues come up a lot. And so what's often characterized as that is that if a white student says that, you know, maybe it's legitimate to you to mention the word or maybe it's OK that it's in Huckleberry Finn. And that's an important uh, historically his important book and opens a lot of doors for conversation about the way that race issues were and are or, you know, any of these kinds of issues. Why can black people use the word and white people can't? Uh, all of these issues, if a white person starts getting into this, it'll be cast as a means for that person to preserve their privilege rather than a genuine question of any merit or value. So it's a, it's a means, it becomes a means of silencing dissent uh, or silencing disagreement or casting disagreement as a selfishly motivated thing. And so... Um, that's not productive. Again, we're violating psychological safety, but we're also shutting down open dialogue. You're shutting down the capacity to learn. And the only thing you can fill it with is this is the right thing, that is the wrong thing, or blatant based moral instruction, which is, I mean, it's up to you what you want to think, but is is moral instruction the job of an education uh, in that sense? And I think most of us in liberal secular, uh, secular democracies think it's, it's really not. Um, so that's one of the issues around, around the word privilege, uh, and how it gets applied within the educational context is it gets used as a tool 
to say that anything that say if a if a white or a male student disagrees with some point that's got some kind of political uh spin on it that comes from a position of um you know a woman or a black person or something to do with it that anything that that pushes back against that wasn't done out of any effort to have a genuine inquiry into knowledge or to understand better but was rather done as an act of of selfish defiance uh, just so that that person doesn't have to confront the reality that they're a privileged individual. And I know you said that, you know, that, of course, there's privilege in all of this. And, and, you know, I see what you're saying, especially when you brought up the example of living in the United States, which is to say by far the global 1%. Right. Uh, and it's very, very fortunate. Most of that, by the way, is economic mm-hmm. <laughs> and in terms of our civil liberties um, that give us those, uh, give us that status. I, I, for one, am actually quite quite skeptical about the concept of privilege as it gets used in a, you know, the more narrow context, like white privilege and male privilege. And the reason I'm skeptical of it, I'm not saying that there's not something that's being pointed to here, but I I think it's looking through the wrong end of the telescope at the issue. As I said, it can get used as a, as a bludgeon or as a tool for, for silencing debate or discrediting uh, discussion or, or comment. But I don't understand what's different between the concept of privilege and then just the absence of some combination of discrimination and disenfranchisement. Uh, And I don't think that it adds a lot to the conversation to try to look at it in a way that pisses on the thing everybody should be able to get to in half. Hmm. Um, Yeah. The, so the, the disc, it disqualifies if you're using that, and, and the underlying assumption that somebody is saying something be, or able to say something because of their privilege is an underlying assumption that automatically disqualifies that conversation going forward. And assuming that intent as opposed to really thinking through the impact. And if, in fact, there is a, a mal, uh, malice in the intent, then let's clarify that and know what we're dealing with, right? As you, as you said, there are people who are racist and they would be proud to admit it. And now that we know that, hey, look, now, uh, we're clear. Now we know what we're dealing with. And one of the things that that I think is is in a, a really, like I said, a really important piece in the in the book is the the understanding of epistemology. And I think this is again a problem in education as well because I'm going to read the quote from the book. The most common mistake in conversations is focusing on what people claim to know, so the beliefs and uh, beliefs and conclusions as opposed to how they came to know it, so their reasoning process. And I think just in general when we think about content and standards, there has been such a focus on product versus process and the idea that you're teachers are teaching content first and hoping to get kids to think and when we think about we're we're called teach thought and that's for a reason we we think that we should be teaching thinking and using the content as grist for the mill and that that process is really but has really been overlooked so that as it relates to conversations i guess let me give give you the opportunity to to unpack that a little further that that role of epistemology in having these difficult conversations yeah so that actually fits within again we go back to the very first section of the book is about conversational goals well sometimes your goal in the conversation is to um your the coarse version of the goal is to change somebody's mind about something the the more subtle version is that you actually want to introduce doubt into what they already believe so that they might rethink it uh, and that's, that's a subtle distinction, but it's actually important. Uh, introducing doubt is often very valuable. Trying to change somebody's mind is often manipulative. Um, so suppose you end up in a conversation where you do feel like you want to, um, as we phrased it in the book, intervene on somebody's cognitions. You want to, uh, you, you want to, to change their mind maybe, or get them to change their own mind through the introduction of doubt. Most people, if you if you start focusing on what they know, they're they're all pretty good. What the religious people call apologists for their own beliefs. Most people are. Most people ha- have some set of reasons and and a web of of maybe real facts and maybe alternative facts around their views that they can use to support why they think what they think to some degree. But 
uh, so if you start focusing on what they think, you're likely going to get them to start bringing out the various uh, defenses that they have that support those those attitudes. But if you start focusing on on how they think they know what they know, then it's very easy for them. If again, if that's what your goal is, is to start trying to intervene in somebody's cognitions, it's very easy to get them to realize that they may not know the thing that they think they know as well as they think they know it. Uh, they very well may. Uh, realize that the processes by which they came to their conclusions are not necessarily adequate. That's very common and very, very much true for all of us. Um, it's also very non-threatening. It's very in an educational setting. It's exactly the kind of thing you want to do. This is, by the way, the Socratic approach: mm -hmm. is to focus on somebody's reasoning rather than to focus, get them to re-examine their reasoning rather than focusing on their um, the conclusions that they've drawn. So. Uh, for here's a here's a neat example from another section of the book about what I'm saying where you can draw you, people don't know things as well as they think they do. There's actually an effect that was discovered. Um, it's called the illusion of explanatory depth. It was discovered by uh, a couple of cognitive scientists around 2000, and what we called it the unread library effect in the book because it's a little easier to get get your teeth into. And so what what they realized was. And the story how they did is pretty funny, but what they realized is that uh, people think they know things better than they know them because they know that other people, they know that, that it is known. Like the example they actually used in, in their, their initial paper was, was how a toilet works. They had people come in and uh, they rated it on a scale of one to 10 or some numerical scale. How well do you understand the, the way a toilet works? the plumbing and all of that. And um, people gave a number, and if I recall correctly, it averaged out pretty close to seven out of 10 confidence in how a toilet works and being able to explain how a toilet works. And so then they set them down and had them write down in as much detail as possible for 20 or 30 minutes how a toilet works and turn in their essays. And then on the way out, um, they asked them again, on a scale of one to 10, let's say, what you know, how well do you know how, how a toilet works? And, and it was, the number had dropped dramatically to almost to something like a four. And people realized by actually trying to go through the process and explain the process of how a toilet works that they didn't actually know how the thing works. Um, so that isn't quite the same as focusing on epistemology, but it is, in a sense, exposing that the that people often are more confident in their beliefs than they have the the warrant to be and of course for an educational process exposing that or if you're trying to get to change somebody's mind exposing that kind of thing is usually step one because it call, creates what the greeks call a state of aporia which is almost an openness to wanting to change their mind um it, it, i would just say that it induces curiosity like wait a minute i thought i knew how this worked but i don't and now i kind of want to or um you know an example with uh with just focusing on an epistemology is, you know, well, how do you know that? And it was like, well, I read it in this book. Well, is, is everything that's written in a book always true? And when the second that they say no, maybe they'll say yes, but then you say, well, do you, does that work for every book? Do you believe that the secret, you know, which tells you that if you just put your positive thought out there, it's going to work, you know, or, you know, this, you could bring up the example of, you know, you don't want to, you don't necessarily have to get religious, but it's the first thing that popped into my mind. Well, you could just use a science book. Never mind. We won't go with the religious example. Um, you could say, well, you know, there are, there are old books that say that, um, the sun goes around the earth and then there are, Newer books to say that, that the Earth goes around the Sun. That's directly contradictory. So something in one of those books must be false, right? And so as the second you start to undermine the that path to to concluding the belief that epistemology. Well, I read it in a book somewhere. Um, there's room now for doubt. There's room now to think, wow, okay, so the way that I concluded that might actually have a flaw in it, and so it's it's a weaker way to conclude the thing than I thought it would be. And people often don't change their mind quickly or on the spot. Sometimes they do. But over time, that kind of thing can erode confidence that's not justified. And then the difference is you say, well, it can erode confidence that is justified, too. And that's how, you know, propaganda and climate denial and all this stuff work. Well, that's true. But the difference is that if people actually go and do the do the homework and they go check it out, things that actually are true should you should keep coming back 
toward those things. Whereas things that you find out that are false, you know, you'll end up moving away from them once you open your mind to that curiosity. So it does, both of those things have moderating effects on people's uh, pre-existing beliefs, which opens the, the, opens the door for people to have uh, exposure to new beliefs, which is required for education, which is also the, the center of the learning process and so on. The whole old, um, you know, I don't know if it's just Bruce Lee or if it was a, a previous, probably a Taoist or Buddhist proverb about filling or allegory about f- f- your cup is already full. You keep pouring the tea in, but the cup's already full. So it just overflows and you've got to empty your cup. Uh, focusing on epistemology, how people came to know the things that they, they know or claim to know uh, often gets them to empty their cup. So you can put in some new tea. Right. And I think the, the, again, some parallels to teaching and learning and what we try to help teachers and schools with is that idea that, again, we're pulling and that you're using questions and you're, uh, in lots of cases, c- trying to create that cognitive dissonance where that curiosity kicks in. And when we think about Bloom's taxonomy, I'm not sure how familiar you are with that, but that's a fairly typical way to think about teaching and learning. There are other ways, but it's a it's a pretty easily digestible way to do that. And the, the pieces of, of the bottom, remembering and understanding, usually remembering is knowledge, but that understanding and, and the point you make about the toilet is very, very true. And I've, I've said this before, you know, there are people who think they know a lot more than they know and they think they understand things that you know that's a, there's a big difference between knowledge and understanding and pushing people to really clarify that is is really important here and does when we when we have that mindset and we're creating a culture of teaching and learning where that curiosity and it's okay that intellectual humil- humility to be wrong and as a matter of fact we, I want to know as soon as possible when I'm wrong so that I can correct that as opposed to I want to make sure that I'm not wrong and I'm going to dig in and prove to you that I'm not wrong. That's a big difference. And, and as we think about teaching and learning, uh, I love as you're going through and, and for listeners, I would recommend the book highly because I, I, I love how you structured this to, I'm going to probably get the, the exact terms wrong, but sort of like uh, four stages of being able to have these difficult conversations as sort of like beginner and then the fourth, the last one is master. I think the third one is expert. I, I don't remember the, the yeah, second one. I think there's six. Um, six of them. Like absolute fundamentals, and it's like beginner, intermediate, advanced, expert, and master, or something like that. Right. Okay. And they do. They get harder. Yeah. Uh, in fact, what happens is the, the the first couple of chapters are extremely. I mean, the very first chapter is an introduction, but after that, so starting with chapter two, um, the book is set up. The techniques in the first in chapters two and three should be accessible to pretty much anybody. The idea is that chapter two lays down the fundamentals that, that should take place in any conversation. Uh, they really are fundamental to having effective conversations, whether you're trying to change somebody's mind, whether it's an educational space, whether you're trying to relate to your spouse, whether you're trying to you know talk to a prison inmate, as Pete's experience would have been uh, professionally, whatever it happens to be, um, they're fundamentals. Then after that, uh, you intru- we introduce the basics of... Um, kind of taking it to the next level and that's should be accessible to everyone and then we start getting into how to have basic you know the basic introduction of how to intervene on somebody's cognitions as i phrased it to introduce doubt or maybe push them toward changing their mind and then the techniques start to get more difficult after that because they start requiring you to either master your natural impulses or your emotions or as in i think that would be uh, by the the fourth chapter or fifth, maybe. Um, fifth, I think, is the one that's about dealing with anger. It's hard for me to remember which number goes with what, but it gets <laughs> along. And then you start getting into the the last couple of chapters that are based on techniques, um, or present techniques, actually start requiring you to uh, think, and the expert-level techniques require you to think in novel ways that, that aren't necessarily natural. So you have to step out of the, the natural cognitive frame and adopt something closer to what uh, hopefully philosophers would usually do to try to get to the bottom of things. And then in the last chapter, it's really the, the master level techniques. That's where you're really trying to dig in and understand where you just have to start dealing with people's moral architectures. And moral architectures are much more difficult because they're tied to emotion. They're tied to 
uh, personal identity. They're tied to community. They're tied to sense of self. Moral architectures are much more difficult to work with. And so it presents just a couple of uh, very, very difficult techniques to, to, to make use of in that uh, master chapter. But So it's, it's kind of this progression from anybody can do this to now you've got to start setting yourself aside to um, now you have to learn to think a little bit differently. And then it's finally like you almost have to uh, be able to – with the with the moral stuff, you have to be able to. It's a weird way to say it, but you have to be able to set yourself aside, um, and take yourself out of the equation, and have a conversation on not just somebody else's uh, verbal terms, but on their their emotional and moral terms, in order to be able to meet them where they are and see see what's happening. Right, right. So there's five. Looks like there's five levels. I'm looking at the t- table of contents here. So beginner, intermediate, um, five advanced skills, six expert skills, and then that master level. One of the things that I don't remember exactly which level it's in. And as we think about this from a pedagogy standpoint, there's lots of spiraling. So the, the things that you see in the master level are building upon and spiraling from the beginnings of this. But I love the. It, and it resonated with me. I, I thought, you know, epistemology, epistemology, the idea of how do you know that, then that sort of shift to a better question, which is how could that belief be wrong and that yes. disproving. So unpack that a little bit, if you would, because I think that's a really powerful shift as we think about not just conversations, but in classrooms. Right. So that's actually, first of all, that's, that is actually the key to, to the scientific reasoning process or as has been described more broadly as what's sometimes called the liberal science uh, knowledge production process. It's how we, we get to closer to truth. And it is um, that is by focusing on in science, the term is falsifiability and in philosophy, it's defeasibility. And the kind of summary term that we used for both of those is disconfirmation. So everybody will have heard, I'm sure, that humans have confirmation, are susceptible to confirmation bias. Or even another related, its cousin, is called desirability bias. Mm -hmm. So confirmation bias is that we tend to... um, we tend to have a bias that confirms things we already think and desirability bias is that we have a bias to confirm things that uh, we wish were true and we desire to, to be true. And so we have these biases and all humans are biased and all humans have a difficulty. It's very difficult as some famous physicist who I should know their name, but I can't remember once said it's very difficult to, it's probably either Feynman or Sagan to uh, prize the diamonds of truth from the firmament of reality, that it's hard to get right answers about things. It's very difficult. And so uh, the way that we do that and the way that we deal with the limitations of our knowledge that we actually can't have absolute truth in most regards is that we focus on putting our best ideas forward, accepting the fact that we're mostly wrong in our best ideas, and then whittling away at them through careful criticism and, as I was talking about earlier, sharpening iron on iron. And so one of the most powerful and simple ways to do that is to focus on what we call in the book disconfirmation questions if you're in a conversational space. So the question is literally couldn't be simpler, and it often catches people completely off guard when you bring it up, and it's perfect for a classroom environment. So we'll have, you know, your stereotypical student, Billy. Hey, Billy, you know, what do you think about whatever it is? And Billy says what he says. And then you catch Billy right in the, and you want to punch Billy right in the ep- epistemic gut. You say, well, that's very interesting. Now give me two ways that that could be wrong. <laughs> You're not supposed to punch your students in the epistemic gut. Well, you are in the epistemic gut, but not in the real gut. But if you do this in conversations, it's actually really profound because a lot of people, we don't naturally think we are actually engines of confirmation. Our natural approach is, oh, we get an idea about the world. We're going to go out there and we're going to see if it's true, right? Then see how natural that feels. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that there's pollution in the water. I'm going to go test it. I'm going to see if there's pollution in the water. You don't, we don't naturally think the other way, which is I have this idea. I want to see how it's false. I want to see if it's false and only under the circumstances that I can't say any way that it's false while I treat it as though it's true and recognizing there might be some other way. So we don't often think in terms of disconfirming our beliefs. We think in terms of confirming them. So to really bring up a learning environment, 
it's and you, if it's like you say, you keep talking about wanting to pull rather than push, or you want it to be about process rather than product. You really do have to, or the Socratic thing in general is you really do have to get people to try to think about how their ideas might be wrong. And the easiest, simplest way is to just ask them. It doesn't have to be true. It doesn't have to be right. How could that belief possibly be wrong? And so we, I think we use an example of the book, a beer truck. And uh, we say, you know, the person, one person hypothetically claims to another, wow, that truck must have a lot of beer in it or something like that. And um, the other one says, you know, this con- example of using a disconfirmation question would be, well, how could that be wrong? And th- that's the question. How could that belief be wrong? And then the other person might say, oh, well, you know, maybe it already delivered all of its beer. Or maybe it's being transported from one city to another empty because it's lighter to pull it that way or something like that. So once you start doing that, the conclusion that mu- that truck must be full of a lot of beer all of a sudden falls apart because you've brought up the possibility that it could be wrong. And we talk about different types of, of scenarios in the, in that section, which is a very long section, actually. I think it's the longest section in the book because um, it's such an important topic. We bring up different scenarios where when you ask the question, well, how could that belief be wrong? You're going to run into people who sometimes uh, they don't think it can be. It absolutely can't possibly be wrong. There's no way you could show that this is incorrect. Right. And how do you deal with that conversationally? So the book goes into that that aspect of things and ultimately it may end up just being a sad state where you have to just switch frames and do something different because the person maybe just doesn't actually form their beliefs on the basis of reason logic and evidence and at that point it's something else you might as well get interested in it and have the conversation see where it goes Uh, (laughs) on the other hand it might be that they can't think of any realistic possibility for how it could be wrong and then you know what does that mean and what do you do with that they only bring up really weird stuff really unlikely stuff and then, then there's the case where they bring up realistic things. Then you can explore those, but usually by the time they bring up a realistic thing, the person's already ready. They're already hitting that state of aporia. They're already ready to start changing their mind or thinking about the thing differently or opening their mind to new possibilities. And so the educational frame is, is achieved. Right. Well, so one of the things that – so you're hitting on the – that mindset that can be really frustrating when you're dealing with somebody who – I think the the example in the book is Ken Ham with the uh, the Ark Encounter, which is not too far from where we're located here. And the idea that when he was, I guess, debating or whatever with Bill Nye, they asked what would what would potentially change your minds, and Bill Nye, of course, said evidence, and Ham said nothing, which means that there's almost nowhere, or not almost, there's nowhere to go with that with him. So it's. It's sometimes just because there are techniques and there's ways to to sort of grease these conversations to help us and, and, and strategies, that doesn't mean it's going to solve every problem. There are, as you mentioned, there are people who just are not going to engage in that rational, rational, reasonable discussion. Um, and, and that can that can just be a, a, a still I mean, it just stop, stops everything going. And I guess, as you said, she sort of, what, sit back and and, uh, and enjoy it. But that brings me to the, the section where you talk about avoiding facts, which is one of those counterintuitive pieces. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, in that case, for me, the, the temptation begins to start trying to argue with that person. And if that person has just told you that they, there's no conditions under which they would change their mind, um, there's no conceivable idea that would make them think otherwise uh, that would disconfirm the thing they already believe what what are you doing by bringing up facts it's not going to change their mind they just said it's not going to change their mind right. uh, all you're doing is, is creating now a kind of an argument um, or you're showing off for an audience so that's where you really uh, when you hit that wall it's again that first section in the book is, is conversational goals for a reason. And so that's when you have to decide what you want to do. You have to shift your, your conversational goal, because if your goal was to change the person's mind, if that was part of your goal, that just got wiped off the table in an educational context. That's a disaster, but you can cut that, you know, you don't have to fight every battle every single day. You can fight that battle another day and let, let things go. Um, for the moment, but the, there are other aspects to conversing, with a human than changing their mind. And so when you hit that impenetrable wall, the, the book isn't titled How to Change Everybody's Mind Every Time. I mean, it's it's how to have impossible conversations. So you've 
entered a conversation, you found a reason that you thought that the person that you're conversing with needs to, to have doubt introduced to their belief. And then they, you get them to a position, you know, in a friendly, cordial uh, way where they admit that they're not budging on that. You could, you have to become the flexible person at that point, and you have to be willing to change your conversational goal. Maybe it's your Uncle Terry at Thanksgiving. Maybe it's your friend from childhood or for life. Maybe, as it used to be more common, it's a problem with social media now is that we're all surrounded by people we mostly agree with and can find them all over the world and collect them to ourselves in little follower lists. But back in the day, you know, you go out and you have to deal with your church or whatever the different meeting group was, and you're dealing with people who actually have different beliefs around you. And you had to nat at school; it's everywhere. You know, you have to navigate people with different views and different different attitudes and different ideas. Um, and so you have other goals. You have to switch gears. You have to start caring about the relationship. Like, let's figure out, okay, you know, you believe that something about Noah's Ark and, and I believe that that's nonsense or whatever it happens to be, but we both like basketball. So why don't we talk about that? Why don't we nourish our relationship? Why don't we maintain our friendship across this difference and let the difference not define who we are? Because who knows, maybe I can't influence you on this idea, but I can influence you on some other idea. Uh, I've, I have that experience all the time since I've written this book with Peter. I've really personally, I mean, this has been really, this is really meaningful to me. I've really opened up and I've started talking with people who I probably would have avoided talking to before. And, um, over and over and over again, I've had the experience where either, you know, I don't necessarily come away agreeing with the person on the thing that was, you know, our difference. And maybe they can't change my mind and I can't change theirs. And maybe we don't try. But what happens is I come to value the relationship between us. And so now I have a friend. Uh, we have other things in common. We have other things that we can do. And their mere presence, you know, breaks down the barrier that people like that are always wrong or people like that come from a bad place or think the wrong way. You know, it's, it, it breaks that down. And so um, you get to where you can listen to people and hear people better when you remove those kinds of barriers and you create relationships. If you want to get a whole social justice thing, they call that relationship allyship <laughs> and they, they crap all over it. They say it's a bad reason to be an ally. It's not good enough that you care about say gay rights because your sister's gay. You actually have to care for some better reason. It's the most asinine thing ever. And if you want to talk about segueing to another technique in the book, that's the build golden bridges technique, hmm. which we also see right now is people uh, burning bridges rather than building them. All right. So, if you don't mind, should I talk about that for a second? Sure, sure. Yeah, so here's something that happens all the time. Somebody has an epiphany, and they're like, wow, you know, I never thought about that before. You're right. You know, I just realized whatever it is. And then you're like, took you long enough. <laughs> wow. You say some jerk thing, right? <laughs> you say some jerky thing. And that's, that's the opposite of building a bridge. You're burning. This is a person who's actually, if you want to get psychological about it, if you want to be real, like I've been that person a lot of times. I know what it feels like. Here's a person who's actually excited about something. They've just had an epiphany and they're being vulnerable with you and sharing it. And then you decide to puncture their balloon, right? The better thing to do in every single case is to build the so-called golden bridge uh, which is a term that came out of the, uh, a couple of the experts of the Harvard Negotiation Project. And the Golden Bridge is something that you build between you that lets them cross over. Like, yeah, man, I'm glad, you know, welcome. Or I, I'll be the first to welcome. I say this on Twitter a lot. People, you know, are deeply intense about some of the social justice things that I'm trying to try to uh, educate people about and, and help people move away from. And, you know, they something happens and I, I publicly say it all the time. I will be the you, you you decide that you have your epiphany away from that. Welcome. I am glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. I don't need you to have agreement with me on everything. I don't care. I'm glad you're here. You know, you saw that. I agree with you. Awesome. Let's go. And th there's a huge difference between being willing to build that bridge with the person and welcome the person who's come along versus some kind of snarky thing or being dismissive or, you know, yeah, well, you still believe all this other crap, you know, or you might think this, but you're still a Republican or whatever. You know, people shut down these these opportunities to build friendships and coalitions and relationships to build rapport and trust 
and to have more fruitful dialogue across difference all the time. And I can't urge strongly enough to get in the habit of practicing welcoming people in, practice inviting people who have the wrong ideas to come stand by your side where they have the right ones. Oh, wow, you know, you're a Republican and I'm a Democrat or whatever it happens to be and you like basketball and I like basketball. By the way, I'm not a Democrat and I'm not a Republican and I don't like basketball, but <laughs> just an example. Um, I don't want people sending me all these emails like, man, I didn't know you like basketball. It's not that I have a problem with it, you know, right. come on in. But it's like, I want to know what you're talking about. <laughs> right, right. I don't hate basketball. I just don't know what it's about. Yeah, well, the... We've only scratched the surface of the book, and and it's I I think it's probably something that a lot of educators may not necessarily see as directly related to their work as a teacher. But I would disagree, and I would recommend it to anybody listening because what it is is it's a mindset, and there are other things. I mean, we we've uh, you you mentioned yes and which who we we've had Kelly Leonard on with. Uh, Second City, and I really believe that improvisational stuff is really important. There's other things, uh, hostage negotiations and altar casting. I mean, I would recommend, uh, we certainly haven't talked about all of the books, so f- folks should, should definitely find it and, and order it. But it, it really, to me, is a shift in the mindset of an educator. And for for lots of teachers, they are often presented with pedagogy specific things that is about math or science or social studies or whatever and to me this is a big shift in there this book will help with a big shift in how we think about interactions between learners and 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 obviously this is not necessarily education specific but it is in how we think about that that those interactions how do we help people think more critically you you mentioned socrates i mean all of those things that we really truly believe in so i i can't recommend it enough it's it's something i think is is really important here so i I appreciate the work that you all have done and i i definitely want to give you an opportunity where will a i'm assuming it'll be on Amazon and all those places. Yeah, it'll be on. I mean, it's it's coming out of a major trade publisher, so it should be on all of the you know retailers online and many brick and mortar retailers that you're familiar with. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's easy to find. Uh, if you go to my Twitter, for example, my you know it lets you put a, a default link uh, right. on your Twitter. My default link is to our publisher's landing page for the book, which has. I don't think it's a direct, maybe, I'm sorry, I don't know, a a direct retailer, but it has links to basically your favorite retailer online from there. It will be available in in digital formats, and it will also be available in audiobook. Peter read that. Oh, and by the way, speaking of Peter, um, since this is an education podcast, I'm not usually into credentialism uh, at all, but a lot of people misunderstand Peter. He's a professor of philosophy at Portland State University, and they assume that that implies that he has a Ph.D., um, but since this is an education podcast, it should probably be stressed that Peter's P- Peter's doctorate is actually an EDD. It's an educational doctorate. Right. So his uh, primary uh, research field is is educational philosophy. So you know this this didn't come out of left field from people who don't have any idea. Uh, of course, I was also an educator for about nine years. Uh, so. Um, I taught mathematics, if anybody cares, but uh, that there there is that basis there. Uh, but certainly, you know, you can find on my Twitter uh, page, which is at Conceptual James, you can find a link to our publisher's landing page. Uh, it will be in all the major retailers. We can put a link under the podcast or something like that, probably too. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll make sure to include uh, so your Twitter handle, Peter. Uh, probably uh, it's worth mentioning your work with Helen as well because I know that the three of you. Are, uh, are uh, and, and Mike, um, you know, give all of those if you would, and any other work that you're involved with, so folks can sort of uh, follow and pull those threads. Yeah, yeah. So um, I did this book with Peter Bogosian. He's actually the lead author. Uh, so he's at Peter Bogosian on Twitter, and then um, we did our probe into the grievance studies work and have gone further. And I've currently been writing a book with Helen Pluckrose. Uh, she's at H Pluckrose on Twitter, and she's the editor, the commissioning editor for Aereo Magazine, which uh, you can find on the web, and you can find lots of things we've written 
there. And then uh, we've been working with uh, both in the sense that he's been kind of wearing two hats, the detached sort of documentarian following us around and then uh, making a documentary film about the work we did on the the so-called grievance studies affair. But also he's been learning this material alongside of us and coming to understand uh, what's going on and is trying to produce uh, films and documentaries and and, uh, short video shorts and video essays about the the stuff that we're studying with uh, generally speaking about social justice. Uh, And his name is Mike Naina, N-A-Y-N-A. He's got a He's got a Twitter. I think it's at Mike Nana, but I know him more from his YouTube presence. So his channel is a good place to go, especially if you're interested in seeing what we've had to say about that and what we've been doing. And that's his YouTube channel is named after him. So it's youtube.com slash Mike Nana. And I do encourage people to check out all of that stuff. Um, in addition, actually, we're starting to try to aggregate. We're building, and <laughs> like we don't have enough going on, we're building a media company around ourselves that's going to try to not we say media company but really it's an educational resource we're going to try to try to start aggregating our materials in terms of explaining the problems that we see in the world and making a one-stop shop for people who are looking for explanations in the work that we're doing and that is called new discourses it isn't really launched yet but you can go looking for it and see it and sign up for the mailing list for when we finally do launch it and if you want to keep up with what we're doing yeah, well, I didn't realize Helen was what you said, uh, editor at Aereo. That's how I first came across your work, because that's what our first podcast was about, the uh, Postmodern Religion, the Faith of Social Justice article that you wrote. So it's always a pleasure to talk with you. And again, I would really recommend educators find this book, and we'll link to it all in the show notes. If you're listening on iTunes, which is, I think, most people, we can't include show notes and links in there, so you'll have to go to the wegrowteachers.com or teachthought.com and find the podcast page for this episode. But, James, again, always a pleasure. Yep, How to Have Impossible Conversations. It's a, it's a pretty good read, I guess. Yeah, it's yeah. Been, it's been good. That'll do it for today's podcast episode. Thanks again for tuning in. Don't forget to review us and share us on your network so we can grow our audience to better meet your needs. Also, don't forget to find us on our websites, teachthought.com and wegrowteachers.com, as well as our various social media outlets.